Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Join our hosts as they discuss a wide range of topics and speak with leading cybersecurity, technology, and compliance experts. Now is the time for Secure Talk. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. Secure Talk is brought to you by Adequest, your cybersecurity and compliance partner. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host of this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we are joined by Cecilia Jung, who is a privacy attorney at Vetter Price in New York. Cecilia is going to walk us through some of the changes in the regulatory landscape for corporations regarding data privacy and cybersecurity, and also give us some hints and tips in terms of what we should do as business owners or executives to prepare for and be in compliance for these many different regulations. So, hey, Cecilia, how are you? Hi, Mark. I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. A little disappointed. You left the West Coast and traveled all the way, and now you're in New York, right? I know. I left the West Coast. I am in New York. It's a, what a time to move, right? (laughs) Right. 2020. I mean, especially earlier in the year, New York got hit obviously really, really hard, but it looks like things are pretty stable there now. I mean, what's your, what's your take on things? Yeah. I mean, we moved actually in the summer of 2019. So I got about, you know, a little more than half a year, um, uh, without COVID obviously. Um, and then when it hit, I was actually in Mexico when it hit, uh, when the stay at home order hit, uh, we, like when I left, uh, there was maybe two cases, I think in Manhattan and then, uh, and I was going to the office, everything was totally normal. And then by the time I got back the shelter in place was here and it was insane. I mean, the biggest, the starkest difference you could ever imagine going from the most like bustling city to an absolute ghost town. Um, I think the numbers have stabilized certainly since then, but they're starting to spike, I think, you know, like a lot of the rest of the country. So I think right now we're like maybe like 0.4% away from shutting down again. Um, So I know it's a little scary. Well, I I, I don't know. I mean, New York got hit really hard at the beginning and it it looks like that maybe they figured something out because the, you know, the the serious cases Mm -hmm. and the the number of deaths is is actually relatively super low compared to what it was. It's actually even, I I took, I took a look today it's it's lower it, the the absolute numbers are lower um in New York than or New York state compared to Washington state which obviously New York state has a much higher population so it sounds like you know hopefully they figured something out but um how how is how is your job is it any different in New York compared to what you were doing out here uh you know i think just sort of the nature of the transactions that i work on is a little different i mean i think here uh, it's more so on the corporate side. I think there's a lot of the clients are a lot more institutional. Um, they're a lot more private equity backed. Um, it's a lot less of the kind of the young entrepreneurial, you know, startup, the Ubers of the world kind of all based out of the West coast. Um, so it's a bit different, I guess it does impact both corporate and privacy. Uh, but yeah, the nature is a bit different. The pace is also a little different. I think though, that's all as a result of the difference in base. Well, I mean, for people that didn't hear us talk uh, on the show two years ago, maybe you can we can back up and just tell oh, us yeah. a little bit about your, your background and what you do. And then, then let's continue on with that thread about um, the differences between what you did in New York and are doing New York versus here. Cool. Let's do it. Um, so I am a corporate and privacy attorney, which means I advise companies through, you know, various transactional decisions that they'll make from formation to exit. Um, and then I help companies assess risk with respect to data privacy and security, both with it, within those transactions and also sort of broader when forming compliance strategies. Well, and, that, and that's interesting. So when you say um, assess risk, or maybe is that what you said about risk? What did you say? Um, you said... Yeah, assessing risk. Assessing risk. Is there... Is there a different prism that you look through from, for example, if you're dealing with these smaller startups on the West Coast versus the more institutional customers or clients on the East Coast? I mean, do they do they look at risk in a different manner? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, it's not it's it's not particular to like the East Coast and West, Coast, but like companies generally just the variety of them. Uh, you know, compliance in the privacy space is so specific and catered to to the company itself. And that's all within, you know, what size you are, what stage of formation you are, like whether you're super established, you know, what kind of 
data you're collecting, what industry you're in, you know, it, it's all very catered and customized. Um, and I think like it's sort of a general trend. Yeah, I think I work with a lot less sort of the up and coming uh, startups out here. But I also think that the startup market in on the East Coast in New York, in my personal opinion, I think people might may uh, disagree with me, but I don't think it's as robust as it is on the west coast say from san francisco or seattle yeah it's it, it, what we've seen is um some of our customers what we would call more institutional like you know we work with a couple large uh, public utility co companies here on the west coast um mm -hmm. we work with several hospitals and for them you know data privacy security compliance is a huge part of their culture right and, oh, yeah. nah. and and then we also work with some smaller, in fact, you know, little, literally startups that um, they, they recognize the importance and they recognize the risk. But at the same time, they're just struggling hard to build their business and, and get to profitability or at least, you know, gain market share. So when you start talking to them about, hey, you know, you got, you got to do these, you got to take these steps to protect your data that, so you're, that you're in compliance with X, Y, Z. They're like, yeah, we know, but... And I mean, do you, have you seen any of that at all? Oh, all the time. I mean, I predominantly have worked in mid-market uh, with mid-market companies my whole career. So I think one of the biggest issues that those types of companies have is scaling. Um, because as you said, you know, privacy is one of those things where, especially now that we are, I would say, fully in an economy where data is the commod commodity and not the byproduct anymore, Um it has to be sort of like in the air that you breathe of the company. Um, and as you say, like buy-in is massive. Uh, so scaling, I think, is the most the biggest challenge that companies have to face when provide or when, when sort of thinking about a privacy compliance strategy. Um, yeah, and I think you know we kind of start with generally speaking, I'll start to sort of tier things like what's the low hanging fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and figure out how it is best to scale. But yeah, that's certainly a challenge. Yeah, I mean, the, the last time we spoke, uh, companies were becoming increasingly aware and starting to prepare for GDPR. And, oh, yeah. it, and But nobody was really sure how things were going to play out because no, no companies had been assessed any fines at that point. Uh, what have you seen in terms of, uh, you know, are companies getting hit with fines? Is it really become, is it, is it become a reality? Yeah, I think it's sort of like big picture. It hasn't been, the enforcement hasn't been as robust as we initially thought it was going to. But like, if you look at the numbers and trends, you know, the GDPR was passed in May of 2018. One fine was issued during that year. 2019, 29 fines were passed or were issued. And then in 2020, 20 fines were issued. And obviously there's like a massive asterisk there because not all fines come to fruition. And some fines get lowered through the process of enforcement and investigation. But these numbers kind of give us an idea of the rate of enforcement. Um, so it, it, it's happening. I think it's just a lot less robust than we thought it was going to be. But obviously, you know, we kind of have to, another massive asterisk is that the year or GDPR is still only two and a half years old. And, um, you know, nine months of that was, has been in the midst of a, you know, a rampant global pandemic. Um, right. So I think right. this year has sort of halted um, or at least slowed the development of, you know, pretty much everything. And uh, that can impact our lives. And the enforcement of GDPR is definitely no different. Well, what what have the regulators been looking at most strictly? Um, because, I mean, GDPR is quite broad in its uh, oh, yeah. in its coverage. So what, what are they really drilling down on? It's it's interesting. Um, I think that was kind of one of the biggest things that we wanted to as like privacy professionals were keeping an eye out on because, you know, are there certain things that are going to be. Uh, you know, bigger red flag than other aspects of the law, because as you say, it is absolutely sweeping. Um, what we've seen, I think, generally is that the largest fines relate to data breach. And that's usually because it's like the, the fines are calculated in a way that um, depending on how many people are impacted. And so many of these companies are dealing with, you know, millions, if not billions of individual data, you know. So that's sort of the one trend. But overall, actually, they have been enforcing on so many fronts of GDPR. Like it's not just data breaches. They've issued fines related to data minimalization, 
lawful processing, transparency, right of access, limitation of data retention. I mean, those are just to name a few. And, you know, in the U.S., I mean, so a lot of companies in the U.S., they feel like, well, GDPR, that's a European thing. And what would your be, what would your answer be to them that, hey, you know, <laughs> go ahead, because I'm not going to answer for you. You answer it. Give the, give the, I, know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was talking about this last time and I was like, oh, people are not going to like this. Um, but it is definitely not just a U.S. thing. I mean, you know, as I mentioned when we spoke last time, it's not, you know, the previous sort of generation of privacy laws, I think, really were catered toward the comp direct companies who were collecting the data. But there's this whole other concept that's been uh, sort of burst out of GDPR, which is the processing of personal data. And that is such a broad category. Um, it includes, you know, not, not just collecting, but sharing, storing, um, you know, getting rid of it, like if you touch it, you know, like that is processing. And so um, there's a lot of U.S. companies that thought that they could just by not having sort of boots on the ground um, in Europe, they can kind of fall out of the purview of GDPR, which is absolutely not the case. That being said, I think if you look at the U.S. based companies that are being issued fines under the GDPR, so far, they are the companies that actually do have boots on the ground in Europe. And when you say boots on the ground, you're saying they're what they have offices there or they have customers there? Or, yeah, or... like offices, employees, you know, any sort of like, a, you know, affiliate that they control, that type of thing. So like, I think the notable ones are Google, Marriott, PwC, you know, they all have a European actual presence. But that's, that's not to say, though, that a company, for example, that doesn't have any employees or offices um, or any other sort of traditional sort of buckets of physical presence in Europe, but deal with uh, like a massive data pool in Europe would not fall under the purview of GDPR. I actually think that is completely not the case. I just don't think we've seen it yet. So you could have a, a, a an airlines that has a, um, you know, a loyalty club. And they've got, you know, maybe 100,000 uh, customers from Europe that, that are members of that club. They don't have an office in most of those countries, but because they have their data, if they don't treat the data in, in accordance with GDPR and there's an issue, there could be a problem there. Yeah, I think it would be like, yes, I think that's actually a more difficult example because like airlines actually have kind of come under fire under GDPR. And it, that, I think they have a harder time arguing that they don't have presence in Europe if they fly to Europe. Um, right. But but say, for example, you are a HR company just based in the United States and you contract with, um, you know, exclusively European companies, you know, and you're processing their employees data. That's a hard argument to say. And you don't abide by the guidelines of GDPR. That's a tough one. Because, like, I, I mean, I would never advise my clients to do that. Um, I would say 100% you have to abide by GDPR. And, in fact, both, you, could, you could have fines and repercussions under both GDPR as well as the contracts that you're entering into because, realistically, your customers are also abiding by GDPR and they've been, done that risk analysis and allocation in your contract. So, you know, so it, it's like that's the type of space where – and I don't think we see those examples so clear cut, but, um, you know, there's some gray area there. Well, what about companies that say, you know what, I've listened to all this and GDPR absolutely does not apply to us, but hey, I'm, I'm here in the U.S. and maybe I'm in doing business in multiple different states. What does their regulatory landscape look like right now? What should they be concerned about? Yeah, you know. And I think the question, too, with regard to U.S. US companies in part is even if the GDPR does not, you know, very super clearly apply to you, I don't think it matters because the landscape in the United States is changing so incredibly rapidly. Um, it's, you know, we're seeing it mostly in California, but there are, it's a topic of conversation in Congress, in you know, several other states. I think everyone's really, start, it's starting to come to light because of the GDPR and inevitably that landscape's going to change and look a lot more like GDPR. Well, you mentioned California. Uh, didn't they recently um, finalize their new, was it the, called the California Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA? 
Yeah, the CCPA. Um, <laughs> they did actually, it was just shortly after um, the GDPR. It was like approved in June 2018, I think, and then largely went into effect January of this year um, with enforcement going into effect in July of this year. Um, yeah, that was that was yeah. finalized, but now there's a, which, okay, let's back up, right? For folks who maybe don't aren't as familiar with the CCPA, it's sort of the U.S. version of the GDPR. It kind of sounds like the GDPR. It's a little GDPR inspired. It's definitely fundamentally different, though. I mean, um, you know, the GDPR in Europe is based off of the premise that data privacy is a fundamental right. It is like our freedom of free speech or right of free speech, right? Like it's, we will only take restrictions on this right in very limited circumstances. That's the type of, that is the spirit with which GDPR was drafted and passed and adopted. Um, California is actually starting to look like that as well. They, so actually CCPA was passed and I think it wasn't, at, didn't go as far as thinking like privacy is like a fundamental right. Um, it still looked and smelled a bit more like a U.S. version. For example, the law only applies, or like they take a consumer lens to the owner of data pri of the of the private information, excuse me, instead of just a resident or a individual, um, just by sole being of individual. So, uh, well, what what does that what does that mean in like in everyday you know practices? What does that actually mean? So the CCPA, so for example, the CCPA has, there's like a question of whether nonprofits will, who collect individual data um, will have to abide by the CCPA because technically they're not profiting off of the data that is of their, that is being collected. So really uh, it's looking at for profit businesses. Okay. So they're you saying know, so, like, then, if you're making money from this data, if you're making money from this data, then you have certain responsibilities, et cetera. But, you know, if you're a nonprofit, then we're, we're not as concerned. Is that, is that what you're saying? Totally. Yeah, totally. And there's, and that's also kind of a gray area. Like, you know, there's sort of tests out that legal tests out there of like nonprofits who kind of like have for profit wings or activities that could put them in the purview of CCPA. But that's kind of in the nitty gritty. Um, but GDPR is different. Is they don't care, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> For profit or not, right? Like you, you are collecting an individual's data who resides in the EU. You have to abide by the GDPR. You know that's sort of their take on it. So, and that's just one example of the way that they differ. But basically, that's kind of all of the CSA that CCP wave was passed, similar to GDPR but different, still with a U.S. lens, um, and. The, and then this year, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a Proposition 24 was a, is a ballot initiative that is actually, it's called the California Privacy Rights Act. So it's a P CPRA, to make it even more confusing, or the CCPA <laughs> 2.0. Some people call it, you know, all sorts of nicknames already. Um, but Prop 24 uh, is a ballot initiative that was actually driven by the same person that pushed the CCPA to come into effect. And um, they're taking a completely different approach in that they're trying to pass this privacy law that will sit on top of the CCPA. Um, and it's sort of, it's going to be passed without, if it's passed, sorry, excuse me, it's going to be passed without um, input from the legislature. So it's purely driven by ballot initiative, which actually I believe Washington has a similar process, but not every state does. Well, um, well what what are the big differences was, between CPRA and CCPA? So is are, are so, consumers getting greater protection now, or individuals getting greater protection, or less, or? So that's arguable. Um, I think the intent of it is yes, that it, it's supposed to strengthen uh, individuals' right, a consumer's right. Um, there are some organizations out there that are kind of arguing against that, but, that, you know, neither here nor there really at this point. Um, some of the big differences is that, uh, so one difference between CCPA and GDPR is that GDPR creates this body of data that they ca call, like, highly sensitive personal information, um, I think maybe just sensitive personal information, but um, it includes things like race, 
you know, ethnicity, health information, sexual orientation. Um, and the idea is that with this type of information, companies or entities can create a profile about an individual, which would impede their right to exercise their free will, really, like your, your privacy, it impedes your privacy. So, um, and that was not in the CCPA before. Before CCPA, we just had this sort of category of personal information, you're either in it or you're not. And then the CPRA, CCPA 2.0, um, creates that new body of sensitive personal information. So now it includes geolocation, race, ethnicity, health information, and um, that's going to be sort of subject to a, a higher level of scrutiny when you are collecting that data. Um, another difference, which is also similar to G GDPR, is that it creates a consumer privacy fund um, and it creates an agency essentially that will help with the enforcement of or lead the enforcement of the uh, CPRA and CCPA combined. Um, and they also are, it's so interesting, they're, they're allocating, I think initially it's like 10 million to this fund and um, that's going to go to the agency, but the agency can use a certain portion of that for enforcement. They can also give grants to nonprofits who are promoting data privacy. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing is like they're kind of create, it's creating this sort of like ecosystem of data privacy that just goes beyond, you know, a traditional in the U.S., which is that the California AG is going to be the only one that is allowed to enforce like the CC CCPA. And I think that was one of the biggest issues with the CCPA and the reason why this 2.0 was pushed was because one, the like their California AG just basically came out and said they could only enforce probably a few cases a year. Um, so I think this is sort of helping to ameliorate that. Uh, whether it will or not, I don't know. I mean, $10 million seems pretty small in my opinion. I think a lot of the European agencies that are in charge of enforcement also have a budget of around, I don't know, maybe it's 10, 10, year, or 10 million euro, um, maybe it's 20 million euro, but even that is like, they're really feeling bootstrapped. So it'll be interesting to see the impact of it. Um, and then the other one other, I mean, I could just like keep going forever, but. It's all right, <laughs> keep going, thing. keep going, not forever, but uh, <laughs> just keep going. <laughs> The other interesting thing is that there is a preemption clause in this, the Proposition 24 is that once it becomes law, oh, and it'll take effect January 2023. So this has been passed. It's like happening. It's a thing. Um, when the, or then the preemption clause basically says that the legislature, California legislature can amend the CPRA once it becomes law. However, they cannot amend it in a way they can only amend it in a way that is more protective than the CPRA. So basically it creates a floor, a privacy floor. Um, and that's similar to what we see in other laws in the United States, right? Like HIPAA federally is a federal law. And it basically says that states can come up with laws regarding the private, the privacy and security of healthcare information. However, it cannot go below the floor of HIPAA, right? So that that's, similarly what's happening with the CPRA and it's kind of giving more teeth to the CCPA. Um, so, and then when we oh, talk, go ahead. Keep going, oh, sorry. Sorry. no, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> and then when we talk about uh, sort of the comparison substantively to the CCPA, I think one of the biggest areas that is causing concern is that the the current law, the CCPA, entitles um, California to demand companies to turn over personal data that they collect about them and to stop the sale of that information. And now, and the definition of sale was where companies were finding a loophole that they were like, oh, we're not selling this information. We're not getting a direct profit from this information, you know, whatever other loopholes they were using. And now it's the, the 2.0 is changing it to the sharing of information explicitly. So there's just, you know, it, it's kind of hoping to plug up some of the holes that CCPA created. 
So if I was a business owner um, and, mm-hmm. and I, 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 in the U.S. and I was like, okay, you know, I've got these large multinational regulations like GDPR. Mm-hmm. I've got national ones like they have in China or Brazil. Um, you mentioned the federal ones that here in the U.S. like HIPAA. You know, there's also mm-hmm. regulations for the different, you know, financial services for uh, public utilities, right? I mean, they all have, um, they're all subject to a, a different sets of regulations. And, and, and as a business owner, you know, or a, a, somebody who's running a business, your company might be subject to multiple different um, regulatory bodies. How do you start and what's your, what would your advice be? You know, I mean, how do you get going on this? Yeah, I mean, I think, and so these, I have a couple of pieces of advice, I think that are sort of the big, my, what I consider the big picture key issues or steps to take. And the first one is, um, if you're really thinking about privacy, seriously, you really need to sit down and conduct a data map. Um, You really have to, and what that means is, you are really doing an inventory of the data that your company is encountering on the day-to-day and what they're doing with it. And that's like, you know, it gets granular, right? Like it's all the way down from uh, information that you collect from consumers on their contact us page of your website, all the way down to the cookies that you're collecting or employee data that you're collecting and uh, where it's being stored, who has access, who are you sharing it with? Um, how long are you keeping it, right? Like that, that is what the data map is. And that is your first and foremost biggest step to take. And I think that's actually the most overwhelming and labor intensive for companies. Um, but it's key because uh, without knowing that, without knowing that information, you can't risk, you can't do the assessment of risk of like, can you be risky in the type in, in the privacy compliance strategy? Can you just do the low hanging fruit, or do you have to go like you know full you know zero to a hundred? Um, and what's then the, what's very- the what's the process that you typically recommend to do a data map? I mean, because we use um, a, a variety of automated tools to do network scans. We also um, we, that we also have, uh, you know, a manual process that we go through and just kind of map things out. But, you know, from and we're doing that more to enact a technical solution that will allow mm-hmm. to us to help our customers protect their data. Um, but the first step, as you said, is to identify, you know, what you have and what needs to be protected. You're coming at it from a little bit different angle because you, you, you're looking at it from instead of maybe a business risk, um, you're looking primarily, I guess, from a compliance and regulatory risk. But what, what what's your process for mapping the data? Yeah, I think they're actually they actually quite go hand in hand. Um, you know, a lot of these privacy laws include re- general requirements that you have to have adequate security you know, procedures and practices in place. And so I think they do go hand in hand, but it's actually quite similar to you, Mark. Um, we have a manual process and that's sort of ca- kind of how we kick off with our clients, because I think if they can give us sort of the big picture buckets of information, then we can figure out who exactly needs to be looped in and how technical we need to get. Um, and so, and obviously that is fit to the type of company, how early stage it is, how much money they have, right? Like have to spend on this. So everything again is super customized, but yeah, very similar to you actually, like it is both a manual and a technical process. Okay. Excellent. And, um, and I'd cut you off cause you were talking about, uh, you know, advice that you'd give to your customers. And the first step would be to, to do a data map. What would be some of your follow-up steps? Oh yeah. Um, the second one I think is to determine your company's perspective on privacy. And actually you touched on this like very early in this conversation when you were talking about buy-in, which I love um, that you said that the, you know, the company's perspective on privacy is so important because as we discussed, it is a customized, you know, process that has to sort of be within every step of your company and every stage of your company and every ind- or every uh, sort of department of your company. So it requires buy-in. Um, and so that means that you need buy-in first from management um, because, well, they are likely to control the budget. So uh-huh. that is you know, number one, but also within your internal structure, right? Like they're also the ones probably determining what trainings are being given, 
you know, what sort of security checks are being happening, you know, what, how often people are coming in to do like security audits, things like that, right? Um, And that is all part of your compliance strategy. And, you know, this is super, super important, particularly in, in the United States, because this space is moving, and it's moving very quickly, as we've seen between GDPR, CCPA, and CCPA 2.0. Um, you know, it's moving quickly, and compliance, well, I'm using finger quotes, you can't see them, but I'm using <laughs> them, is um, it's actually a moving target. You know, it's a moving target, it's not perfect, and it's not linear. The, there's even these privacy laws are, they're just trying to rapidly, rapidly keep up with the technology that's already been created in the last 10 years, but largely unregulated. So this perspective on privacy, this buy-in is going to be your root, the, the roots of your compliance strategy. Well, um, it's interesting when you mentioned buy-in though, because like, I look at like, you know, the different types of risk and, you know, regulatory and compliance risk is you know one of the sticks that you could get hit with if you if you're not careful with your customers data uh, but there's also business risk right you know i mean if your data is yeah. uh if your data is not accessible because of some kind of ransomware attack and you're you can't you can't you know talk with you can't deal with your customers your business is shut down and then there's that reputational risk that you know if you if your data has been bre- you hacked and you've lost all of your customers data or, or you know hackers have gotten access to it guess what? Nobody's going to want to give you their data anymore, right? So there's these different okay. types of t- different types of risk. Um, and when you get pulled in or when you're when you're engaging with your clients, are they primarily con- looking at the, um, the 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 compliance and regulatory risk? Or are they, are, are they aware also of these other types of risk? And, and do they do they talk to you about those as well? Oh, yeah, I think it's a mix of both probably predominantly regulatory, though I think they acknowledge that uh, the regul. I actually think that the at this point, the business risk, I mean, it obviously depends on each company, but uh, a lot of times the business risk can be a lot bigger than your, um, than your regulatory risk, because enforcement is so kind of up in the air at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, the, especially, for example, I do a lot of mergers and acquisitions and in those deals now, more and more, data privacy is becoming a key issue, right? And they're realizing that if you really want to sell your company, you got to the point where your company is profitable and successful and you have bidders and people want to buy it and you want to sell it and get out, you're going to find that these buyers are not willing to uh, you know, purchase a risk um, that includes non-compliance with privacy laws, especially when you are a data-driven company, you know, so that's a business risk, right? Like that's not a regulatory body coming down on you, but that will impact, you know, the money that you put in your pocket and ultimately how you value your company at the end of the day. So I think um, there's certainly a mix of both. But one thing also too, that it's kind of the flip side of that is um, I went to a talk, like, I don't know, last, this was in Seattle, maybe two years ago or something. And there were some heads of privacy from large companies and uh, Starbucks is one of them. And someone had asked him, um, you know, when you're creating this, you know, or how do you make sure that your company, you know, values data privacy in the way that they should like that sort of, sort of that, like a line of questioning. And he basically said that privacy, you can look at it as a very uncertain landscape, but it's also, if you're in a consumer-facing company, it's a massive opportunity to create market share. If you become the first company of your kind to be the one to really prioritize data privacy and your consumers know it and they feel it in their user experience, like that creates a loyalty that you cannot buy that you could not buy before, right? Like th- this is just a new space um, and people are realizing how important it is. So that's also, it's like maybe perhaps not the business risk, but perhaps business opportunity. Yeah, and I'm sure he's talking about a much uh, more in-depth plan than the example I'm going to give. But I always, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I always feel good. Like when, you know, you know when you're, you're signing up with a new uh, uh, retailer or you're, you're doing some new transaction online and you've got to give them some information and there's always that box that says, would you, you know, would you like us to send you more information about blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And 
I always feel better about the company if they don't have it automatically checked. Yes, you know what I mean. Yeah. And 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 I yes. know that. And I know that now. I think that it, it, that's it's a rule or a regulation, at least in Europe, and it may be even in the U.S. That you have to opt in. You can't be pre. I don't know what the word is. Pre opted in, but um, but you, I still come across sites where they they just make the assumption that I'm going to want it or they're hoping that I'm not going to notice right or you know like um, yeah. you know you're at you're at a travel website and they're and they're like uh, they they put you down for the insurance um you know as kind of like the um the the default setting uh, so you know you're buying the insurance and, and instead of saying hey do you want the insurance opt into it right for for your trip and so it always makes me feel better and i think I think it's I'm I'm just a normal consumer, you know, so and I, I'm pretty sure <laughs> that kind of experience coupled with some of the examples that I'm sure the the um the privacy officer at Starbucks could give in terms of, you know, letting informing uh consumers, you know, you know, exactly what you're doing with their data, um, how you're gonna protect it, stuff like that. I I think it, you're right, it's a huge opportunity. Totally. Absolutely. And actually, at first, Mark, I wouldn't consider you like an average consumer because you're pretty well versed in this space, I would say. Um, but yeah, I've actually started going through my apps, for example, um, and the one that I have profiles with. And and obviously, I'm also not an average consumer <laughs> because I do know this space, but I, I like to go through sort of with an layman's perspective to see what are the privacy policies look like? Which ones have the options, right, for me to delete my data, access my data, um, you know, prohibit sharing of my data, like those types of things. And uh, I've exercised some of those rights to see if it's actually in play. And it, you're certainly seeing them. And I actually have started making a few decisions that um, when I don't have those options, like, for example, you know, TikTok's the big hot thing. Um, and right. I specifically didn't download it because I looked at their policies and they're horrifying um, and awful. So, you know, I think that totally is uh, a consideration that companies should make. Um, but, you know, getting back to your question of like what, what companies need to do when figuring out their compliance strategy, because everything is so piecemeal in the United States, and I do want to say this, but um, is that, you know, Figure out first, once you have your data map, you can kind of figure out uh, with the right counsel uh, what what laws you have to abide by, number one. And then two, you can do an assessment of which ones are the most restrictive. And I think I always tell my clients, look, like to the extent commercially reasonable and that and I'll get into what that means, go with the most restrictive law because these laws, again, are changing. And that's just the that is the way that's the direction things are moving and they're not going to move back um it's kind of you just can't really undo a ccpa type law once you have it right consumers are going to expect it individuals are going to expect it so and the commercial reasonable aspect of it is that's where you kind of do your risk assessment right like okay this is the most restrictive law but you know, we're really only dealing with, you know, 5,000 individual data, you know, you know, we're really only a, you know, $50,000 company, you know, if that's the case, then it's going to, your uh, compliance strategy, even with the most restrictive law is going to look a bit different than a company who is a multi-million dollar company dealing with, you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals data. That sounds, makes sense to me. Absolutely. Um, I'm just curious. It looks like that we may have a new uh, a new president, a new administration. Um, that seems to be the, <laughs> the seems to be the consensus. I know that maybe I know that some people in your industry are um, are are fighting some battles right now to see how that's going to turn out. But um, uh, assuming that we have a a new administration, do you see any major changes between you know what's what's been going on the last four years in terms of privacy in the U.S. Um, versus what uh, what uh, perhaps a Biden administration would do? Yeah, um, I think, you know, obviously this is all like, you know, conjecture, who knows. Um, but, but it's fun. Let's do um, it. <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> okay, let's do it. Um, you know, especially in the Trump administration, you know, privacy was not a, 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 was not a priority. Um, it just, that was made clear. And also the other wait, 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 wait. It was made, it was was made clear. A, it was was it made clear by the president himself who spent like he gave like you know half his life was on Twitter. I mean, so yes, correct. You don't have to comment on that, but I mean, it's like... yeah, absolutely. Um, that was not his priority, and also 
you know, international relations was not his priority. And I'll explain why this is a little different and why that has an impact. Um, the Biden administration, so in, in the Trump administration, once GDPR was passed, um, and this is actually before GDPR, but there was this, what we call the privacy shield. You're probably well aware of it. Yep. Um, and it's that with pursuant to that program, uh, companies can share data between Europe and the United States, um, and that is sort of like a, a valid basis, a legal basis for you to be sharing data, which would otherwise be restricted by the GDPR. Um, there was a decision um, that basically said that, okay, this is not very questionable, and you know we don't think this is a valid right, and um, it's not a it's not a valid basis to be sharing data. And then, and the Trump administration really, I think, at that point, didn't care. <laughs> Like, I don't think that the Trump administration actually cared about severing any sort of international ties, both generally, but in this space as well. I think that, number one, will be a key consideration for the Biden administration. Obviously, there's a lot to deal with when he, when, if, and when, I'm crossing my fingers, um, <laughs> they go into take office, but... Uh, you know, such as the corona and uh, a whole host of other issues. But I think privacy will be a ma major topic of conversation. And even in the Trump administration, Congress was has proposed multiple federal data privacy laws. And uh, I think the latest now, there's actually one that was recently proposed uh, that is called, I believe it's the U.S. Uh, setting an American Framework to ensure data access, transparency, and accountability act. I define that on my document. Wow. Um, I, I, hope there's it's an a mouthful. I hope there's an acronym for that. <laughs> I know that they have to come up with one. Um, but it's that this is supposed to be, I actually, uh, admittedly, I haven't read it, but read the bill, but it's supposedly a combination of the last few proposed or uh, bills that have been proposed in Congress. We'll see what happens. Right. But I think, because data is becoming such an important topic of conversation um, that the Biden administration kind of has to take it as a priority, um, or at least they can't leave it at bay like the Trump administration did. Sure. Makes sense to me. Um, well, hey, you know, we've uh, rattled through about 40 minutes here already, and I, I, you've given us a lot of great information. Any, uh, any closing thoughts or any, um, you know, suggestions to, uh, to our listeners out there in terms of, you know, what they should be doing? Um, you know, I would just like to encourage folks to not get overwhelmed by the privacy landscape. I think it's really easy to do that. But, you know, as you and I have touched on, data privacy is something that impacts everyone. Every single individual out there has data. And um, so whether you're a professional in this space, whether you're just a, an average consumer, completely not touching data privacy at all on the regulatory side, you know, it's something that everyone should care about. And um, that's certainly the direction in which these regulations are moving. And we should find, find that a good thing, hopefully. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, if, if from where we sit, if um, if business is going to increasingly move to the cloud, um, the only way we can do that is if if you know if we trust the consumers and and in our in our other business partners, if we can trust that they're they're handling our data in a secure manner, uh, and that's that's a foundational <laughs> part of this whole movement. So um, I, I, you know, and you you gave some really good advice. Um, I would highly recommend. I mean, if you're if you're um, running a business, uh, an executive in a company, um, you, and you're concerned at all. Just just reach out to somebody like Cecilia, uh, and um, you know a good a good um, privacy attorney, uh, and, and and find out you know what what's my exposure, what, what very high level, and then you know and then maybe you need to dig in a little bit deeper uh, depending on your industry and your situation. But in in in, in that light, if, if somebody wanted to to reach out to you, does Vetter Price? What's your what's your website? What's your URL? Is that the best way to, to get a hold of you? Yeah, my URL. You're really putting me on the spot here. I, I think it's just betterprice.com. I'm actually just putting this into my browser right now as we speak. But yeah, if you search, if you search betterprice.com and you search my name under professionals, you'll find me. And and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if it's okay with you, I'll I'll put a link to your website and you know and of course your name in the uh, the description of this uh, this episode. 
That sounds great. Thank you so much, Mark. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Likewise, Cecilia. You take care. Hello. Welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Join our hosts as they discuss a wide range of topics and speak with leading cybersecurity, technology, and compliance experts. Now is the time for Secure Talk.